He is actually a board-certified cardiologist, and I'm happy to say he's about the only attorney that I feel comfortable sitting, standing in the room with at the same time, <laughs> um, because he actually is a practicing attorney. So uh, through 15 years of practicing cardiology for his patients, he became aware of the enormous toxicity associated with trad traditional dental restorations. He has written uh, several books addressing the wide-ranging properties of vitamin C and its role in the neutralizing or in neutralizing toxins to resolve infections, as well as its role in the treatment of heart disease and cancer. Right. He is currently engaged in ongoing research regarding the impact of the orthomolecular application of vitamin C and antioxidants on chronic degeneration or degenerative diseases. And he's working on his 12th printed book right now. Is that right? 12th? Off to the printer. All right. It's off to the printer. It's called Magnesium, Reversing the Damage. All right. Everybody, please put your hands together one more time for Dr. Thomas Levy. Okay. Thank you. Just looking at the title of this talk, I know, myself included, we've talked a lot about root canals and root canal toxicity over the years. And I think it's also important to know that there are ways to minimize toxicity because you're going to have patients that refuse to have root canals and or other infected teeth extracted. They might not hurt, so they don't want it extracted. They're not interested in an implant, but they want you to do what's best for them under those restrictions or lead them to what's best for them under those restrictions. And that's some of what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> Let me say, and this is sort of a corollary to what Dr. Yu was talking about, is uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is the medical treatment of a dental patient, and you might say, well, I'm in no position to do that. Well, anything that you don't feel comfortable doing yourself, if you haven't done it already, seek out and make an alliance with one or several integrative medical doctors uh, in your community, have lunch with them, see if you're on the same page. and. If you're talking about referring a lot of patients, they're going to be interested in listening to you, but you just need to see if they're willing to learn or are already up to date on some of the things we're talking about. Because if we could get that type of coordination, I guarantee you there's an enormous extra amount we can do for our patients, okay? And that's not always important. A group like this excluded, I'm going to tell you, it's my sad opinion that over 90% of physicians' number one concern is not their patient welfare. And that's sad, but I firmly believe it to be true. It's only when these things coincide that that's the case. Okay? As with all my talks, I want to give you as much reference to the medical literature as possible. So wherever you see a number, you can go to PubMed, to put that number in the search box, hit enter, and you'll go straight to the abstract where this particular fact or piece of information came from, and sometimes you'll have access to the entire article if that's what you want. Now, <clears throat> also something that is not only critical to this presentation, but is also, in my opinion, essential to applying and understanding good dental and medical care to everybody, is to understand what I consider to be the unifying theory of all disease, okay? We hear a lot about oxidative stress. And we hear oxidative stress, disease, disease, oxidative stress. And it pretty much seems to be that wherever there's oxidative stress, there's disease and vice versa. And so they talk about oxidative stress being associated with disease. Well, I'm going to tell you and show you in a moment, oxidative stress is disease. Okay? 
It doesn't cause disease. It's not a reflection of disease. The state of oxidation or electron depletion in an array of biomolecules is the disease. It's only where they're located, what their concentration is, etc., that determines the disease process itself. But when you get down to the molecular level, the only difference between a normal biomolecule and an abnormal or dysfunctional or non-functioning biomolecule is whether it's reduced or oxidized. That's it. I mean, even if it's a molecule in an Alzheimer's brain, it's no different from a abnormal biomolecule in liver disease. It's just oxidation. Now, synonyms. Prooxidant equal toxin, toxin equal prooxidant. A toxin, the only way it exerts damage is by directly or indirectly causing a biomolecule to be oxidized. So, and the degree to which it does it, the location, the different characteristics of a toxin determine the disease because it'll go to different areas of the body, water soluble, fat soluble, ionic. That determines where the oxidative damage is located. But, final common denominator, an increased number of oxidized biomolecules is the disease state. Antioxidant, vitamin C is the prototype. Actually, when you look at a healthy diet, a healthy diet is only healthy to the extent that it eventually metabolizes down to a molecule that has antioxidant capacity. In other words, it breaks down to a molecule that's able to donate an electron. The donation of electron is nutrition. The taking away of electron is toxicity at the molecular level. So, number two significant there, pathogens. Pathogens are nasty because they are far and away the primary source of new toxin exposure to patients and individuals on a daily basis. The pathogens themselves produce exotoxins, endotoxins. They also break down into prooxidant metabolic byproducts, and perhaps most significantly, as they metabolize and break down, they release large amounts of free iron. Pathogens all thrive on iron, and there's really nothing more toxic you could have in your body than an excess of iron. So, I mentioned this already. All disease is increased oxidative stress, and it has to do with the fact which biomolecules are oxidized, where are they located, what is the percentage of oxidized biomolecules relative to reduced? How long have they been there? That's it. Now, <clears throat> in going on to the rest of the presentation, let me outline for you what I consider to be the primary promoters of all chronic degenerative diseases. Number one, far and away, far and away, the most prominent cause and exacerbator of chronic degenerative diseases is infections, okay? Those related to them, of course, we know a lot about the dental sources, tonsils, gums, lymph nodes, sinuses, teeth, all of these things can be ongoing chronic sources of toxins and pathogens. Now this is one that I don't know has ever really been discussed. But in my research, in my personal experience, I'm coming to believe, and so I like to differentiate before you what I find in the literature and what I've concluded for myself. This is what I've concluded for myself. And that is a major provoker and sustainer of the pathogen processes we have is the fact that 
I would say the vast majority of people have a chronic pathogen colonization in their upper respiratory tract and in their nasopharynx. And it has a lot to do with the types of breaths people have. Some people never understand why they have such a foul breath. Well, I think if they nebulized the right substances, penetrated the biofilm of something that they've had for years, break down and kill those pathogens, you'd find things suddenly normalizing. Consider this. And I'll have to relate a little personal experience here. In my research for my magnesium book, now, I mean, I knew about nebulization, but I didn't know about nebulization. And I started seeing things that caused pathogens and broke down, bio, caused pathogens to die and broke down biofilms. Biofilms are a biggie. It's not just a catchphrase. There's a lot of things that are very difficult to resolve because you get a whole slew of mucus, connective tissue, and everything else enveloping uh, colonies of pathogens that never proliferate to the point of being an abscess, but they nevertheless proliferate, and they proliferate 24-7, and they produce toxic byproducts 47. And what are you doing when these pathogens are in the nasopharynx? 24-7, as the young people like to say, you're swallowing pathogens. You're swallowing toxins. Those are toxic too, just as if you got them injected into your blood. The correlation now of pathogens, oral, to different diseases is gradually getting overwhelming. You can find Porphyromonas, one of your prototypical periodontal pathogens, in bowel cancers. You can find it in stomach cancers, in stomach ulcers. You can find it in the breast tissue of patients, ladies with uh, breast cancer. Of course, you find it in the pericardial fluid of patients with chronic coronary artery disease. You find it in the coronary arteries where you have atherosclerosis. You find it in the carotid arteries where you have carotid stenosis and NR directory specimens. You find it in ruptured cerebral aneurysms. You find it in biopsy specimens of Alzheimer's patients. I'm going to tell you, in my humble opinion, you're going to find oral pathogens in just about every disease process if you analyze the biopsy specimens and collect them correctly. This is really, to me, potentially the dawn of a new form of, of, of uh, a medical treatment because most of our medical treatment is always to treat the symptom, try to reverse the oxidative damage, but we still don't completely know all of the new pathogen insults we have on a daily basis. My mentor, Dr. Hal Huggins, told me many years ago when I was babbling on about let's do this, let's do that, and he just sort of looked at me and shook his head somewhat condescendingly. If you knew Hal, that wasn't hard. And he said, Tom, I said, yes, sir. He said, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. Okay? And it's so true. We have to remember that the optimal the effective clinical protocol for anything has two primary components. Repair, try to get oxidized biomolecules back into the reduced state, and prevention. Try to prevent new toxins from coming in and causing new damage that needs to be repaired. Uh, you can sometimes get very nice partial clinical results but until you address both those parameters on every patient for every condition, you're going to fall far short of the mark. So, chronic pathogens, known toxin exposures, iron, calcium, <clears throat> iron, calcium, and copper, the three toxic nutrients. Uh, I have another book called Death by Calcium, and it's entitled that because it's not an exaggeration. Calcium 
is one of the most toxic substances you can ingest once you have adequate calcium in your body for normal physiological functions. All diseases in all disease cells share one common denominator, increased intracellular oxidative stress. All of those cells share another common denominator, increased, intracal increased intracellular calcium levels. As calcium goes up, oxidative stress goes up, disease worsens, and in many cases, when the stress goes even higher, you have carcinogenesis in a cancer cell. Dietary toxin exposures, and here I'm gonna really hit hard on this. Hormone imbalances, sex, cortisol, and thyroid. Also, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, insulin. Now, a few words about this, the focal infection and colonization. I would submit to you that when you have a focal infection in your body, statistically speaking, well over 95% of the time, it's going to be due to something going on in the oral cavity. Root canal, chronic apical periodontitis, gums, tonsils, sinuses, infected lymph nodes. Now, I think very few people, if any people, let's say after they have a severe cold, and even if they take the right measures to knock out the pathogens, <clears throat> I don't think many of them recolonize normal beneficial bacteria in their nasal pharynx. I think for many people, once they have that flu, once they have that cold, and unless what I'm talking about is specifically targeted, they maintain an abnormal nasopharyngeal colonization for life or until it's corrected. And this is just layered on top of all the other oxidative stress that you have. Without getting too indelicate, I want to tell you that once I started my nebulizations, and I can give you more detail about that later, and got rid of some chronic problems that I've had for a long time, all of a sudden, for some reason, my bowel movements were perfect. Okay? <sighs> you don't poop well when you're swallowing pathogens and toxins all day long. It's really that simple. <clears throat> Ooh, sorry about that. Other focal infections, very uncommon, but if you have someone that you're absolutely certain has a clean mouth, no tonsil problem, then you need to start looking at these other sites for potential sources of seeding pathogens throughout your body. Okay, just said that. And these, if you're interested, are the citations that can show you how Porphyromonas as a hallmark periodontal pathogen, not the only one, is present in gastrointestinal cancers, various oral cancers, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer. Oops. Now, even though it might not be well accepted among my cardiology colleagues, I'm going to tell you it's very well established that well over 90%, I'm just being conservative by saying greater than 90%, but well over 90% of atherosclerotic coronary arteries are in a state of chronic focal arterial scurvy because they're chronically colonized by oral pathogens. Now believe me, if you think about it anatomically, there is nothing more remote from the oral cavity, when, especially when you're going via the vascular system, than the inner lining of the coronary artery. You got to go from veins into tiny veins up into the pulmonary arteries, come around, and then once you've gone through all the venous circulation, all the pulmonary circulation, 
Then you suddenly go, when the left ventricle contracts after the left atrium drains into it, into the coronary arteries. The reason why the coronary arteries so avidly permit colonization of these oral pathogens that didn't colonize anywhere else on their way there, blood pressure. These, these pathogens are just mer going along their merry way at a venous pressure of 5, 10, 15 millimeters of mercury into the left atrium, and the moment they get into the left ventricle, and the left ventricle contracts, whoomp, 10 millimeters of mercury up to 140 millimeters of mercury, 25% of the cardiac output in the coronary artery, and basically mechanically slammed into the coronary intima. And of course, not just a one-time event. 24-7. If you have something going on in your mouth, you're seeding 24-7, and you're hammering the coronary endothelium 24-7. <clears throat> this one, to me, is just about as conclusive as you're going to get. Um, in this one study, 38 out of 38 patients, and that's about 100%, right? I'm uh, not, not good on my math. 38 out of 38 chronic coronary artery disease patients had atherectomies. Just carve out the plaque and then examine the plaque. And they were compared to patients with normal coronary arteries, uh, post-autopsy specimens, post-coronary artery. Well, in all 38, greater than 50 bacterial species were identified, most of them periodontal. There's the reference site. 92% also contained fungi. And these were all common periodontal pathogens. Similar results were seen in carotid and arterectomy specimens. Now, what are periodontal pathogens doing inside the coronary artery more remote from the mouth than anywhere else. They are metabolizing all the vitamin C, causing inflammation. Then the immune system comes in to try to quell that immune inflammation. And if it were a one-time exposure to the bacteria, it would do the job, but it's not. The bacteria are coming in 24-7, so that acute inflammatory response is chronic. And once it's chronic, the inflammatory response becomes the disease because in the course of consuming all the antioxidants inside the artery, specifically vitamin C, you lose physical integrity of the blood vessel. Now, the body's designed to try to compensate against something catastrophic. Now, nothing could be much more catastrophic than your coronary artery rupturing because it's too weak and can't, it can't sustain systolic pressure anymore. So what does it try to do? It's a poor choice, but it beats rupture as you start building plaque to thicken the arterial wall and make it stronger in the absence of the collagen and connective tissue the vitamin C would otherwise allow you to synthesize. And that works until the plaque becomes so big it blocks off the blood vessel, and you have a heart attack. <clears throat> and in another study, they looked at heart attack victims, sucked out the blood clots, and in over 80% found periodontal pathogens in an extremely high concentration, 1,600% higher than the serum, causing the acute blockage that finally caused the heart attack to occur. So you have the periodontal pathogens throughout the wall of the coronary artery, in the plaque of the coronary artery, and then in especially high concentration when the final platelet blood clot finally completely blocks off the blood vessel. I mentioned this, but here you can see this and you can check the references if you like. And this is the list because, to my knowledge, they haven't looked anywhere else. But as I said before, the more places they look and use refined PCR testing, they're going to find these periodontal pathogens, in my humble opinion, 
involved in virtually every disease process in the body. But we see it in pericardial fluid, malignant breast disease, colorectal cancer, head, neck, oral cavity, lung, esophageal cancer, inside the tissue of the brains of Alzheimer's patients. This was a 2019 article. Tissue from ruptured intracranial aneurysms and tissue in carotid and arterectomy specimens. All right, now, shift gear a little bit. As I mentioned before, and allow me to reiterate, number one, all disease is increased oxidative stress. And number two, that increased oxidative stress causing disease is always intracellular. Furthermore, if you can, by some manipulation or clinical protocol, get the increased intracellular oxidative stress down to normal physiological levels inside a cell that's part of a diseased organ or tissue, guess what? You've got a normal cell. Conversely, when the normal cell is allowed to increase oxidative stress, it becomes diseased. So, what are the direct factors that directly impact this all-important parameter of intracellular oxidative stress, whether it's normal levels or elevated levels or astronomically elevated levels? Number one, of course, I just told you is calcium. You'll never find a diseased cell, hear me on this, you'll never find a diseased cell in any disease process that if you're able to assay the intracellular contents, the calcium is not elevated. That's part of the pathophysiology. It's almost the entire pathophysiology. Number two is magnesium, which is, with calcium, it's the yin and the yang. You can't have elevated calcium and magnesium at the same time. You can't have low calcium and magnesium at the same time. If one's up, the other's down. And if you want to get the one that's elevated down, you push the other one up. It's a natural antagonist to calcium functions. And it is a natural calcium channel blocker. So we have prescription drugs that block calcium from coming into the cell and we have natural agents such as magnesium that can do the same thing. Of course, there's vitamin C. Nothing's going to be more important to normalizing intracellular oxidative stress than normalizing the levels of vitamin C. And then there's glutathione. Now let's look at one, each one a little, little more closely. So what I've told you, let's look at this sentence right here. I would submit to you the manipulation of intracellular calcium levels appears to be the most straightforward way to positively impact intracellular oxidative stress and thereby positively impact any and all disease processes. And when I say disease processes, I mean infection too. I mean, if you're able to normalize oxidative stress inside cells of an infected tissue, the pathogen is going to be done away with automatically. It, it can't sustain itself in cells that don't have, uh, that, that, that have, that don't have increased intracellular oxidative stress. Now, as I just said, calcium's up, magnesium's down. This is important. When intracellular magnesium levels are normal, there is no increased intracellular oxidative stress adhere. The cell is then physiologically normal. Plain, clear-cut, unambiguous. Vitamin C, well, it's pretty obvious. Vitamin C is your most important antioxidant in the body, largely due to the fact that it gets into all the tissues as readily as glucose since it uses the same transporters to get inside the cell as glucose, and because it can donate <clears throat> two electrons per molecule, and because there's an intermediate state of 
vitamin C called the ascorbyl radical, where it donates one electron, but it hasn't donated the other electron, and that's a stable entity that can circulate in your body and provide you with an electron buffer so that if the microenvironment needs an electron, it'll donate. If the, if the, if the microenvironment needs an electron taken away, you can take it away. So it can go to fully oxidized vitamin C or it could go back to fully reduced vitamin C. That's why even though you have a lot of antioxidants that have greater OREC values and in a test tube they take up or absorb electrons or donate electrons a whole lot more readily, the most important part of how important an antioxidant is to your physiology is how readily it gets everywhere it needs to go. Glutathione is important, but it's really a secondary player because if you have elevated calcium, low magnesium, low vitamin C, you can take glucose, excuse me, glutathione supporting uh, supplements all day long, and it's not going to counteract not addressing directly the calcium and the magnesium. On the other hand, when you get the calcium down, when you get the magnesium up, when you get the vitamin C in, all of the oxidized enzymes get reduced, start functioning again, and you make as much glutathione as you need. Along with the fact that when you do this, you also start detoxing because you reduce previously oxidized detox enzymes. And it's different from one individual to the next. Everybody's got a different toxin load. But when you go to the measures that I'm going to talk about that normalizes these processes, you start kicking out toxins like crazy. OK. <clears throat> now, hormones. Hormones do many different things, but as I look at it, I didn't get this out of an article, as I look at it, all hormones share two important features. Number one, they all, 100%, positively modulate normal metabolism to optimize and accelerate it, make reactions go faster, more efficiently. That's basically what a hormone does. But all hormones also do number two, Oh, that didn't sound good, did it? <laughs> uh, maybe they helped that too. They all minimize or normalize inter increased intracellular oxidative stress, which remember, that's the goal. Now, insulin, hydrocortisone, thyroid hormone, and the two sex hormones, maybe that makes five, but I'm calling that four of the bodies most important hormones. Now, effectively speaking, I don't want people to nitpick me on here, the way vitamin C and magnesium act in the body, affecting every cell in the body, I think it's good to think of them as two additional vital hormones just because of the way they impact the biology and the physiology positively of every cell in the body. And, all the combinations haven't been thought of, I assure you, but I'm going to give you some examples later on. Always think about combinations of these above six agents when you're trying to manipulate or optimize the intracellular oxidative stress of a patient with a given condition. Because they're the ones that bring that oxidative stress down, and I'm going to show you why. Let's look at estrogen. Again, you have references for all of these, so if you get bored and you want proof that I'm not saying crazy things, go check it out. Estrogen serves as a calcium channel blocker. That's good. It serves, look at this, to effectively raise intracellular magnesium levels. It promotes magnesium retention in the body by increasing renal tubular reabsorption. By itself, it's a powerful anti-inflammatory, <clears throat> and it lessens metabolic syndrome parameters. And look at this, it decreases all-cause mortality. Remember, if something 
is able to decrease your chance of death from anything, it's positively impacting 100% of your cells, not just one organ system or one, one other system. Testosterone, much the same thing. Calcium channel blocker, anti-inflammatory, decreases all-cause mortality, lessens insulin resistance, so it sort of has a synergistic effect with insulin, and it helps to optimize the function of other hormones. Oh. <clears throat> okay, insulin. When I started doing my research for my book for magnesium, I got to say I, I needed to put a seat belt on my office chair because the information on insulin that virtually nobody knows about is mind-numbing. Let me give you a radical statement here, my opinion. The ability of insulin to facilitate glucose uptake into the cell may well not be its most important function. I think its most important function is it helps pull magnesium into the cell. Magnesium is concentrated inside your cells 10,000 fold more than extracellular. But, I just said, if you're going to bring the calcium level down inside the cell, you've got to get more magnesium into the cell. So how do you get magnesium into the cell against an incredible concentration gradient like that? Insulin. Insulin does the trick. In diabetics who are insulin resistant and you're getting frustrated by using higher and higher and higher doses of insulin and not getting any control, almost uniformly, such patients are severely magnesium deficient, and the moment you start supplementing magnesium, the insulin resistance drops. So really, the first thing the cell needs is more magnesium for the insulin to start doing its job. Also, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, directly promotes vitamin C uptake. It also conserves magnesium. And I don't know, maybe somebody can help me out here, but I always had this sort of vague idea that insulin somehow magically metabolized glucose. But as best I could tell, the only thing insulin has to do with glucose is it facilitates its uptake into the cell. So everything else is extraneous to that, and the fact that it facilitates vitamin C uptake and magnesium uptake, I think if you're able to normalize intracellular oxidative stress, small amounts of insulin are going to take care of the glucose intake, no problem. Everything works better when there's no excess oxidative stress. Everything works optimally when there's no excess oxidative stress. Hydrocortisone, powerful anti-inflammatory, also a calcium channel blocker. And guess what? This was a study that Nina Mikirova, Dr. Ron Honeyhackey, and I did at the Reardon Clinic about six months ago, just looking at <clears throat> whole vitamin C levels inside uh, monocytes and giving different forms of vitamin C uh, with and without hydrocortisone. Well, guess what? Hydrocortisone massively increases the uptake of vitamin C inside cells. Now, what does the immune system do? It's designed to quell inflammation. That's my understanding of it. If you have inflammation somewhere, the immune system gets mobilized. Why do you get the inflammation? You get the inflammation because antioxidant capacity, spearheaded by vitamin C, has been massively depleted in that area, and that's your inflammation. So what is the immune system trying to do? Well, the first cell, at least in the case of the heart inflammation they've studied, the coronary artery, the first immune cell to show up is the monocyte. 
Guess what? Second only to the neurons, the monocytes have the most vitamin C of any cell inside the body. They have 80-fold, 8,000% more vitamin C than in the plasma. So think about that. The first cell to show up at a site of acute antioxidant depletion is the cell that's most packed with vitamin C. I submit to you, my opinion, that number one, the primary role of the immune system across the board is to alleviate inflammation by supplying vitamin C to those inflamed areas, which is the primary physiological insult causing the inflammation. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to tell you that I believe the primary overriding function of hydrocortisone to implement its incredible anti-inflammatory effect is that it pulls vitamin C into the cell. For your consideration. Now, <clears throat> incredibly enough, how am I on time? Okay. Incredibly enough, as incredibly important as estrogen, testosterone, hydrocortisone, and insulin are, it would appear by some data that I'm going to share with you that thyroid hormone status is your ultimate hormonal regulator of getting oxidative stress back into the normal range. So let's look at what thyroid hormone does. Uh, it only, well, those are just, well, let me uh, go to the next slide here. Hang on. Ah, doggone it. Okay. There's some functions of thyroid hormone, which also brings magnesium into the cell. But let's look now, and I've talked about this in the past, but I think it has more significance now in the setting of what I'm laying out for you. What has thyroid hormone been proven to do in chronically ill patients with mouths full of root canals, uh, diabetes, hypertension, all variety of diseases? Dr. Broda Barnes, I'll get it right, don't worry. Dr. Broda Barnes looked at 1,500 patients that he treated over a 20-year period. Pretty impressive private practice. He specialized in treating hypothyroidism. He had his own way with body temperature and a few other clinical factors of really being able to tell who was a little bit down on the thyroid. Now, he used desiccated thyroid, and over a 20-year period using desiccated thyroid, four of 1,600 patients had heart attacks. If you look at the Framingham study, 72 people of the same age and range and diseases should have had heart attacks. That's a powerful protective effect. And he even noted that uh, the four heart attack patients he felt in retrospect received inadequate doses of thyroid. So that even opens the door to the possibility that properly adjusted thyroid status can give close to 100% protection against the dissemination of focal infections. Obviously, if your patient is willing, you extract an infected tooth, you extract a root canal. But if they don't give you permission, you can't go yanking out that tooth. But they say, doctor, please help me as best you can, just don't take out my tooth, then that's the time to get together with your integrative medicine doc that hopefully you've developed a relationship with and said, let's check out the thyroid function. Now, regular thyroid tests really are almost worthless, except for showing you if you have hyperthyroidism or showing if you have massive hypothyroidism. But they're going to do virtually no good for showing if you have minimal subclinical cellular hypothyroidism, which is the entity what we're talking about. 
We're not talking about a sick thyroid gland. We're talking about a sick thyroid status at all the cells throughout the body. Now, okay. Oh, I got this thyroid stuff down the way. Let me zip ahead. Yeah, okay, then I'll go back. All right. So, practically speaking, then, what do you do in a patient to determine if they're slightly low, but pathologically very significantly low in thyroid function? Well, you look at the the lipid panels, but most importantly, you look at reverse T3 and regular T3 levels. Reverse T3 basically is a blank check. It, the, the, there, there's four iodine molecules on T4, and, but it's stereochemically important which one you take. You just can't take any one. So if you take the wrong iodine off and make T3, it's inactive T3, reverse T3. You take the right iodine off, it's potent T3, the functioning active form of your thyroid hormone. Well, as it turns out, good old oxidative stress, the more oxidative stress you have in your body, the more you have it inside your cells, and what you have inside every cell of your body are enzymes called deiodinases that will cleave iodine off T4, T3, T3 T2, okay? But if you have a lot of oxidative stress, those enzymes are oxidized and they don't work. Or they don't work in the way you want them to. So, probably the best way to detect a low thyroid patient not reflected on the regular thyroid function test, which I really don't advise looking at at all, except maybe as a baseline, is the free T3 to reverse T3 ratio. This is important. We, we think about, obviously, when we think about thyroid function, we think about the thyroid gland. That's pretty logical. Well, as it turns out, T3, which is your active form of thyroid hormone, not T4. T4 is a precursor. The active form of T3, of, of, of thyroid hormone, only 15 to 20% is produced inside the thyroid gland by converting T4. The rest of it, 80%, is produced inside every cell of your body. So you have a trillion little thyroid glands out there, and that what, that's what determines your clinical thyroid status, is how well are the cells of your body taking up T4 and converting it to T3. And as I just said, when there's a lot of oxidative stress, the enzymes don't work, so this doesn't happen. And so you end up, you end up needing to do two things at the same time. You need to try to identify and eliminate those sources of oxidative stress. And at least in the interim, until you know how the patient's going to respond, you need to appropriate, you need to uh, start an appropriate amount of thyroid therapy. Best done with desiccated thyroid, but also maybe T3, but not T4. The most popular thyroid supplement now is T4, Synthroid. Well, what did I just tell you? The defect is not in not having T4, the defect is in converting the T4 to T3. So, so many hypo, hypothyroid patients, they get on their Synthroid, their traditional numbers look good, they tell their doctor they still feel like crap, and he or she says, well, your numbers are fine, you're doing okay. <clears throat> so. Dr. Broda, in his work, said your temperature should end up between 97.8 and 98.2. Your reverse T3, T3 to reverse T3 ratio should be 18 over 1 to 20 over 1, more or less. And just as an example, the, is because there's a lot of crazy units on these tests. So your free T3 
let's say, is 3.1, your reverse T3 is 18.4, but one is picogram, the other is nanogram, one is milliliter, the other is deciliter. So to convert the picogram per cc to nanogram per deciliter, you multiply by 100. So 100 times 3.1 is 310, over 18.4 is 16.8. Now, so that's a low, not a massively low, but that's a low ratio. That indicates a mild degree of subclinical hypothyroidism. The type that's going to allow a root canal or an infected abscess tooth to give your patient a heart attack. Very important number. So, if the T3 levels are normal, your main concern is going to be eliminating oxidative stress. If your T3 level is low along with an elevated reverse T3, that means you need to initiate dual therapy for sure because you probably have focal infection along with a thyroid that's not doing optimal function. Maybe a little improve over time, maybe not. You never really know until you get rid of the focal infections how well your peripheral thyroid function is going to respond. Okay, and I'm not going to go into this. This is how Dr. Barnes would build up his dose, but very important if you're the one given the thyroid is you got to go slow. Thyroid function cannot be replaced with big doses quickly. It has to be slow. You need to stick with the dose for a few months at a time before you increase the dose. Now, I don't know why more people don't use this. Uh, even, even at home, when you want to measure your baby's temperature, whatever. These are the most incredible devices I've ever seen. Laser-guided temperatures. They're actually usually, they're used for mechanical purposes, you know, to, to zap equipment to see how hot it is, see if it's overheating, see how cold it is. But guess what? You get someone to open their mouth, lift up their tongue, you go bang, you got it. Just like that. Just have to make sure there's not a cold beverage or a hot beverage for about 15 or 20 minutes before you do it. And you have a vastly more accurate temperature. I suspect Dr. Barnes would have liked one of these, but I don't think he had it. It would appear that completely normal function, thyroid, euthyroid, minimizes and optimizes body-wide oxidative stress and largely blocks the ability of focal infection to disseminate. Now, all of this is important too, even if you're absolutely certain you've gotten rid of all the focal infections. I mean, everybody, you should want to have their hormone function as well adjusted as possible if they're looking to you, their healthcare practitioners, to give them their optimal health. But it's also great as a second choice of protecting your patients that you either can identify or get rid of the focal infections or they won't let you get rid of the focal infections. Also, There is no disease cell in the body that has higher intracellular oxidative stress short of apoptosis or cellular rupture and destroying it than a cancer cell. And when the cancer cell gets even higher intracellular oxidative stress, but short still of self-destruction, it becomes metastatic. The metastatic anaplastic cancer cells are the ones that have the highest levels of intracellular oxidative stress. And it would appear, this is more of an opinion, I can't give you an article on this, it would appear that normalizing your thyroid function also, in addition to blocking the ability of focal infections to disseminate, blocks or inhibits the ability of cancers <clears throat> to further destabilize and start spreading or metastasizing. Matter of fact, they have articles that show, obviously in a, in a cancer cell like this, you have massively increased calcium. And they have studies that show when you can chemically pull the calcium out, you can take a metastatic cell and bring it back to a non-metastatic cell, and when you bring the calcium levels even further down, 
you can sometimes have a cancer cell revert to a normal phenotype. Okay. So, this can't be done until you optimize magnesium and vitamin C levels inside the cells of the body. A few little points about magnesium. Roughly 99% of the body's magnesium is inside the cells. And 95% of the intercellular is inside the mitochondria. So when you're talking about diseased mitochondria, you're talking about mitochondria that don't have enough magnesium, amongst other things, but that's probably the primary defect. You're never going to get your mitochondria to serve you well and provide you with energy as long as they're depleted of magnesium. I think you all know I've written a lot about vitamin C. Well, I'll put on your seatbelt because I'm going to tell you something. The most important supplement there is is magnesium. Vitamin C is number two. Vi magnesium deficiency truly underlies, aggravates, worsens, and sometimes causes every disease pathology there is in the body. And nothing can take care of a magnesium deficiency other than magnesium. So you can be real low on vitamin C, but if you take a ton of other antioxidants, you can partially compensate for the antioxidant deficiency of the vitamin C by keeping what levels you do have recharged. So obviously you need both, but I just want to emphasize how important magnesium is. Blood levels are irrelevant unless they're low. If the blood levels are low, then you're really low everywhere in your body. But if the blood levels are normal, the vast majority of people are still deficient in magnesium when you start looking inside the cells. A test has come out recently that can give you a good, in my opinion, so far with the information that I've seen, your best reflection or measure of your body status of magnesium is this exitest.com because they take some cells from underneath your tongue by the frenulum, run them through some fancy machine, and measure the magnesium levels. And they've already correlated it to other uh, biopsy specimens in the body, so it seems to have a high correlation and doesn't really reflect the blood level one way or the other. So, how do you supplement it? Many oral forms exist, but they all, for the most part, will have you pooping your brains out long before you get enough magnesium in your body. That's not to say that they won't help you. I mean, people are low in magnesium, you can get a lot of positive effect, short of optimal effect, but a lot of positive effect if you take any form of magnesium. Even, even garbage like magnesium oxide will help you out. Now, never miss the opportunity when you have an IV for any reason at all to put magnesium in it. Okay, you're just missing a, the fantastic opportunity to give yourself something and build things up and not have to worry about other forms of supplementation. Very quickly, they have a couple studies that still blow me away, even before I knew hardly anything about magnesium. They gave unstable angina and heart attack patients in the ICU a gram of magnesium an hour for 24 to 36 hours. So 24 grams or 36 grams over a day or a day and a half. And that was it on magnesium. That one time, although large, one time dose of intravenous magnesium decreased all cause mortality still at five years. So five years down the road without a single additional magnesium supplement they were living longer because of that one-time infusion. Both vitamin C and magnesium are water-soluble, but take vitamin C in, you pee it out. Take magnesium in, and you build it up and store it inside your cells. So they're very, very different in that regard. Uh, this liposome encapsulated magnesium 3 and 8, 
is a superior form. Matter of fact, it's so good, you have to be, in my opinion, almost as careful with it as you are with intravenous because magnesium is enormously beneficial, but you take too much, it's enormously toxic. You could take an IV, for example, and you can, you can dial up your blood pressure. You could take anybody from any blood pressure down to any level, down to zero, and kill them if you give them enough magnesium. Matter of fact, and this should be of interest to our, our dental colleagues here, they have a phenomenon, well not a phenomenon, they have a protocol called controlled hypotension during surgery that they usually use for dental surgeries and other bone surgeries where it's very difficult to get hemostasis. So an additional thing they do is they just give you enough magnesium until your systolic blood pressure goes from 130, say, down to 85 and keep you there until you get hemostasis and then let the blood pressure come back up again. The point being is, you can dial up any blood pressure you want with enough magnesium. Now, the oral form of liposome magnesium isn't going to suddenly drop your blood pressure down to zero, but if you've been taking it for a long time and then you start to feel a little weak or lightheaded, well, start checking the blood pressures and you'll probably find that you're gradually reaching a point of magnesium satiation, okay? Not like vitamin C. You need vitamin C for the rest of your life. Magnesium, you need to get your body levels normal, and then you need a lesser degree of maintenance to keep it there. But it's an individual thing. Transdermal applications help. A good way to avoid the bowel effect. Nebulization. Okay, I want to tell you now. <sighs> I told you how important that nasty, pathogenic nasopharyngeal floor is. The nebulization, in my opinion now, I've been doing this for several months, working with it, $30 nebulizer. All the stuff that you need, another $10. About the cheapest thing you can do, and DMSO, magnesium chloride, sodium ascorbate, sodium bicarbonate, uh, zinc, 3% hydrogen peroxide, insulin, hydrocortisone, all of these things in different combinations do incredible things. And I now travel with a nebulizer and I need it at this time. I started a little raspy something yesterday. You hear a little cough now, but it's going away. That's because I went right up to my room and I added some uh, DMSO and hydrogen peroxide and water together and nebulized it for 15 minutes. That'll knock the crap out of any, any new nasopharyngeal colonization or infection that you could, that you could uh, uh, wave a stick at. I will tell you though, and it'll depend, vary from one person to the next, some people have greater susceptibilities than others, so for some people, they'll probably have to do it more frequently than others. But you ever run into these people in the airport or at a conference like this, and they come up to you, they don't have bad breath, but they have this fruity, queer smell to their breath. It's how I call it pre-cold pre breath. And they might keep it and never develop a cold, but that exposure will give you one, okay? I think this can all be eliminated with good nebulization. So far, probably the best acute and chronic approach to these pathogen colonizations, and also helps loosen up the sinuses, guess what, they're all connected, is, and roughly, five cc's of, of DMSO, five cc's of a saturated solution of magnesium chloride and sodium ascorbate, and 10 to 20 units of insulin. Nebulize it. Why the insulin? Come on, you know why the insulin, right? Pushes the magnesium and the vitamin C inside the cells you're trying to protect from the infection, as well as being antipathogenic agents themselves and promoting the Fenton reaction, etc. cetera. Uh, we're just about through. 
<clears throat> there are many important supplements. The top five, in my opinion, are magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin K, and some form of iodine. Now, many, many more important things than that, but nobody should be seriously concerned about their health and being taking a humongous supplement program without all five of those as well. Those have to be part of it, in my opinion. Incidentally, except for the iodine, each one of those, magnesium, vitamin K, vitamin C, uh, vitamin D, each one of those independently as a monotherapy decreases all-cause mortality. So how important is that? Now, different forms of vitamin C. Of course, the liposome encapsulated, uh, intracellular, multigram doses of sodium ascorbate, extracellular, <coughs> oral administration of ascorbyl palmitate, fat soluble. We're doing some things at the Reardon Clinic now where trying to get as much vitamin C 24-7, as they say. So they develop little bladder systems that can put a steady infusion, even as an outpatient, into you as you go home. This is producing good effects. Intramuscular administration, and number six. <clears throat> I introduced this subject some talk a few months ago. All I can tell you is... <sighs> This might be one of the greatest supplements so far in the history of man, and that is fetuses make vitamin C, newborn babies make vitamin C, many babies one and two years old make vitamin C. That means it's not a genetic code defect. You have the gene for vitamin C, you're just not transcribing it. And as it turns out, there are some new supplements that have developed, pure nutrients, polyphenols, that appear to cause you to read through a stop codon that's abnormally causing you not to transcribe and make the final enzyme so that you can synthesize vitamin C inside your liver from your own glucose. I've been on it for a year and a half, and it's, it's done miracles for me. I don't have time to go into all the details, but I will tell you very quickly, I made myself the primary guinea pig on this. Now, when you, if you have a certain amount of vitamin C in your blood and you're not making any, and you get exposed to a huge toxin that metabolizes vitamin C, what's going to happen to the vitamin C level in your urine over time? It's gonna drop down and disappear. You're gonna use up all your vitamin C. On the other hand, if your liver now is capable of synthesizing vitamin C and responding to stress, what's going to happen? Bring in the stress, and the urine levels are going to go up. And my toxin was scotch. And, oh, I don't like scotch to this day now, but I, I wanted to make sure I took enough of it so that my body would interpret it as a toxic insult. And boy, did it interpret it as a toxic insult. But... My urine vitamin C's were in the low normal range. Start taking the scotch. Rise, rise, rise. Got blitzed out of my mind. Next morning, still high. 24 hours later, still high. And finally comes back down to a normal level. So it basically took 24 hours for my liver to make enough vitamin C to neutralize the toxicity of that scotch. But if your liver can't make it, it, the urine levels would have just dropped down to zero. Most people, you give them a big infection, virus, you measure their urinary vitamin C levels, they're zero. They're using up all their vitamin C. So, this is something that's changing the formula. It doesn't displace any of the other supplements. It doesn't say, don't take vitamin C, don't take liposomes, don't take all these other things. But boy, does it make them more impactful for your long-term health. So, recap. Completely eliminate sources of, sources of focal infection whenever possible. 
Always optimize the status of significant hormones, sex, thyroid, and cortisol. Target all clinical pro protocols with the idea that the maneuver you're doing is lessening intracellular oxidative stress. Always, the big two, the big two, always optimize vitamin, uh, magnesium and vitamin C levels in the body, and consider the judicious additions of insulin, hydrocortisone, along with magnesium and vitamin C in intravenous infusions. I forgot one thing I want to mention. <clears throat> Talk about how much incredible information is buried in, 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 in plain sight in the literature. There are multiple long-term, prospective, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials, massive numbers of patients, wound care with either topical or systemic insulin massively accelerates quality healing. How many wound care centers do you know of that routinely use insulin in accelerating wound res resolution? So I just give that for your consideration. Don't deny your own brain of thinking for itself. If you see something phenomenal in the literature, don't think, don't let your first thought be, well, if it's that phenomenal, somebody would be using it. No, no, no. So, for optimal health and even possible reversal of existing medical conditions, the best of all is to prevent, which frequently means <clears throat> teeth extraction, and to repair or reduce oxidized biomolecules. However, when it is not feasible for any combination of reasons, economic, patient preference, etc., very strong attention needs to be paid to the principles of focal infection containment. Okay? And most importantly, this is good for you whether there's infections or not. These are important principles to follow even if there's no suspicion of occult focal infections. Thank you.